Welcome back to Switch to Linux. This is Tom. <laughs> so we're not doing a tinfoil hat time, so I've taken the alien off my uh, array of neat stuff. Um, but I didn't want to, I wanted to have a more scholarly background than a more computery background because today we're going to be talking about more of a scholarly type topic. It is December 1st. It is almost 1 o'clock Eastern Time AM and Nobody has acted, so Rule 41 goes into place today. <laughs> what does that mean? So I wanted to talk about Rule 41, what it is, why it's controversial, uh, where it came from, and is it too overblown or is it not overblown enough? Is it really this major first sweep killing all the privacy of America? Or is it something that's definitely justified in our modern technological era? Uh, so if you have not been following what Rule 41 is, uh, this is a, um, a select judicial committee, um, not elected officials, but, but selected officials, uh, voted on a couple of years ago, and finally in May of this year, 2016, uh, issued this proclamation that unless Congress acted, by December 1st, 2016, Rule 41 goes into effect. So what Rule 41 is, it is a um, amendment to the search and seizure. And it specifically says that at the request of a federal law enforcement officer or an attorney for the government, a magistrate judge with authority in any district where activities related to a crime may have occurred has authority to issue a warrant to use remote access to search electronic storage media and to seize or copy electronically stored information located within or outside that district. And there are two conditions. A, um, the district where the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means or b in an investigation of violation of 18 usc code 1030 subsection a5 the media are protected computers that have been damaged without authorization and are located in five or more districts so let's break this down and talk about what this is and, and where it came from and what really is the controversy well the big controversy is when you are, or when law enforcement rather is conducting some type of uh, procedure, some type of search, some type of seizure, obviously we have this Fourth Amendment which guarantees us protections against illegal searches and seizures without warrant or cause. And so what has to happen is the law enforcement has to go and get a search warrant from the judge and the judge would issue the search, would, would allow, you know, grant the search warrant, the law enforcement has to take the search warrant now, sometimes they peacefully take it to you. Sometimes they kick in your door, curse at you, and point, you know, some machine guns at your head. Um, regardless, um, that's the method of the search and seizure. The problem is that there was a high-profile case we will talk about in a little bit where a warrant was issued, but it was deemed by many people to be an invalid warrant because the it was issued by a judge in a jurisdiction where the final perpetrators uh, had no jurisdiction. And so that became the question. And there became a second thing added to it. So it's basically two amendments added to the search and seizure rulings. So the first part of the amendment leading to the high profile case was in 2013, the FBI seized a child pornography ring. And instead of seizing it and closing it down, they decided to run it for a few weeks. And so the FBI was distributing child porn. Way for our government. In fact, it came out not too long ago that at any given time, the FBI controls about half the sites. So that kind of poses some questions. But what they're doing is a lot of these sites are using anonymizing systems. Um, the most common one, although not the only one, the most common one being a Tor network. And by taking advantage in some of the vulnerabilities, not in the Tor network itself, which is very difficult to, in, to, to track down, but by taking advantage of computer flaws, either on the, the people's computers or in the browser that they're using. Um, my cat is very interested in this topic, apparently. Um, 
so basically, um, uh, basically what happened is the FBI took over this website in 2013 and they took advantage of some browser exploits and you, they acting under a warrant in Washington, DC, they seized a site, which uh, I don't think it was in Virginia. I thought it was more South somewhere. I forget exactly where the site was. I didn't follow the case that closely. Uh, but what happened is they deployed some scripts on the site, which distributed some malware, which would leave the anonymizing system and ping back their real addresses. And the FBI used this information to track down the perpetrators. And it turns out that some of those perpetrators were actually convicted, but some of them were let off because the judges determined that the search warrants were not valid because the judge that issued the warrant did not have jurisdiction in the place where the perpetrator finally lived. And so point A of Rule 41 seeks to address that. That as long as, like, in other words, if the FBI finds a server in Virginia, the Virginia judge could issue a search warrant which is, would be applicable to any computer that connects to that network and goes out. So that is that first portion. Now it applies A when the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means. So what that specifically means it is language without saying the Tor network they're targeting the Tor network. So in other words uh, and we'll get into the the problems with this in a minute. Uh, but that kind of gives us an, into our first problem is it becomes an assumption that anyone who uses an anonymizing network is automatically doing something wrong. So that kind of poses in part of the problem. Now the second issue has to do with something else and I didn't read as much up on this but uh, I'm very familiar with, with the, the situ situation here. So what this has to do with is this proliferation of IoT devices or Internet of Things. So Internet of Things includes um, IP cameras or your thermostats that you can program from your phone or even at, at our local Best Buy or a local Verizon store and a few other places, probably even at Walmart at this point, you can buy a, uh, I know an outlet, you can literally buy an outlet that you can control from your smartphone. So you can turn it on or off from your smartphone. So literally anything you plug into that outlet, like a lamp or something, um, you can control with your smartphone. That's an Internet of Things application. And so with the Internet of Things application going, the problem with these Internet of Things, we need to stop using so many internet. Does our refrigerator need connected to the Internet people? Really? Are we so incompetent in making simple shopping lists? We have to have our refrigerator tell us when we're low in eggs. Just let's back away from all this technology just a little bit. Yeah, me, the geek who runs every operating system in my office at any given time is saying, slow down from the computers. Put down the smartphones a little bit. Just breathe a little bit. Okay, because the problem is these Internet of Things devices are terribly insecure. Um, they have easy to break systems, very easy to determine passwords. Now that's gonna get better with time. And they get better as they get you know, more available on the market. For example, when I got my first router, when I first hooked up a wireless network in like 2005, I think, man, at that time, any router that you bought at the store, we think it'd be silly and laughable now, but any router you bought at the store, you plug that in, it had an open access broad, you know, wide, you know, broadcasting free, no password, whatever access to my internet line. But of course, in 2005, not everybody had a laptop computer or some other device that would have connect wirelessly. Wireless device connected things were fairly rare back then. And then, you know, as, as you move along and I got uh, an upgrade to my router, I don't know, 2010, 2012, somewhere around there, I upgraded my router. Now it had a default password. Now the router is getting so complicated. They got multiple broadband systems. And unfortunately, I think they've overcomplicated them to the point. But at least the point is they're securing the devices now. They're giving them all different passwords rather than a default password, except 
the administrative platforms are generally still shipping with a default password. And it's either admin password or admin admin or admin blank. That's the most common. And you access it by getting onto network 192.168.01 or 192.168.11. That gives you access to a router. And if somebody has not secured their router, you can usually get into it with admin admin, admin password, or admin blank. Unless we secure our stuff. And that's the thing. We have our computers are moving in such a way where we are not tech savvy. We've learned how to plug things in and let it go. Well, when we plug in an Internet of Things device and let it go, it becomes an easy hacking access point on our home network. And that's what ends up happening with these botnet issues. So what happens is um, in internet technology, there's a thing called the denial of service attack. And a simple denial of service attack is when a computer tries to ping on a server several times. Ping, ping, ping. Each time a server hits, a response has to come back. Well, almost any network and any admin guy with any have a brain cell and can look up some basic internet security on an Apache server installs a security mod that prevents a denial of service attack. A distributed denial of service attack on the other hand is different. So there's a difference between a DOS attack and a DDoS attack. A DDoS attack is when a lot of computers ping you all at once and that's accomplishable by the botnet. So the problem is up to just recently, and I totally forget my numbers, I'm going to totally make up some numbers out of the air, but up till just recently, like the largest DDoS attacks have been a few hundred megabytes per second targeted at servers. But with this mass proliferation of vastly under-secured Internet of Things devices, these Internet of Things devices are being massively compromised into these giant botnets that one hacker goes, go, and poof, a third of the web gets taken down, literally happened like six weeks ago. Uh, because what they did is they took down, down the DNS, uh, the, like is Dyna servers or something, I forget exactly which one, you can look it up. But they took down one of the largest DNS uh, configuration systems which took down a major websites. Huge portion of the web was down or very drastically slow because of a botnet attack. And that is exactly what part B of rule 41 is doing an investigation in violation of 18 usc 1030 a5 oh i forgot to look that up um 1038 5 deals specifically with um i'm going to look up the exact wording for you um but it deals specifically with uh computer hacking so i'm going to come over here and a great place to look up individual laws, by the way, is law.cornell.edu. Um, you can pretty much look up any law. So is that five? I'm looking for, oop, that should be, I typed in, typed in wrong on my search. It should be A5 is what I'm looking for. Okay, so A5 says, um, so A, whoever. A5, whoever knowingly causes the transmission of a program, information, code, or command and as a result of such conduct intentionally causes damage without authorization to be protected uh, to a protected computer. In other words, a computer that's not theirs, they don't have permission. Or B, intentionally accesses a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct recklessly causes damage. Or C, intentionally accesses a pro uh, protected computer with other without authorization and as a result of such conduct causes damage and loss. In other words, any hacker accessing this and the code in rule 41 specifically says in five or more districts which means this is not something just a hacker this is a botnet hacker somebody who is distributing botnets anywhere rule 42 in its ruling allows for any magistrate in any district impacted to issue a warrant for any computer involved in that botnet so that in itself is a kind of long version of Rule 41. And I wanted to do such a long version of Rule 41 so you understand that there are major, major, major good, good, good reasons to have this Rule 41. Okay, I'm not like, throw it out because it sounds bad. <laughs> a judge can get a thing anywhere, okay? That is a different issue. So I wanted to get that part out of the way to say, I get what they're trying to do. A, 
We want a way to de-anonymize people who are exploiting children and committing other dangerous crimes. I get it. I agree. Okay. And B, we need a way to take down some of these botnets that are getting out of control. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this, and I am going to get into some of the controversy, but first, the, the ruling for this came out in May, and Congress and or Senate had to act to stop it. And a couple of parties in each have been acting. So the Senate and Congress jointly, um, that's not it, there it is, there it is, on October 27th, 2016, so I'm not sure, May, June, July, August, September, October, why did they wait six months to get this letter out? Okay, so in, in only a month and a half, actually, what, five weeks, this is the end of October, and at the beginning of December is when this rule is supposed to come into, into effect. And they write the Attorney General with some very specific questions. And these are fascinating questions. Okay, number one, they want to uh, they want to know what would prevent the government from forum shopping under the proposed amendments. So forum shopping is when I know that there's three judges, and I got two judges that are very sympathetic to one particular type of crime that I have a guy I want to prosecute for that crime. Well, I'm not going to the two judges that are sympathetic. I'm going to go to the guy that either doesn't care or doesn't like this type of guy. That's called forum shopping. So a, a very prominent use of forum shopping in this case is patent trolling. So there is a company that files hundreds of patents uh, violations against various companies of great and small, oftentimes prohibitively damaging them and shutting them down for what in almost any jurisdiction in the history of the universe would look at it and go, shut up and go away. But there's one judge in one little town in Texas that seems to want to hear them all. And so all of these patent troll cases go to this one stupid little town in Texas where all of these fake fights are going out in court over patent trolls where guys are like, I own the right to an iPod. Um, yeah, you were five when that came out, idiot. I don't care. I still talked to my dad once. You know, that's forum shopping. And I, that is a absolute legitimate concern. If I come back and I say that there's this situation and I need to get a warrant to block these computers. So that was the first thing. And that's what a lot of people are saying. However, and then now mind you that, that a month later, November 18th. So this is only a couple of weeks ago and there was a holiday in the middle of it. So... Maybe we could be a little bit more expedient. This kind of sounds like the Affordable Health Care Act. Let's pass this thing so we can see what's in it. <laughs> no, let's stop, slow down, and understand what's in it before we pass it and let it go. Okay, and that's kind of what I'm going to be arguing for here. Um, so November 18th, they send a letter back, and they specifically debunk the idea of form shopping um, because, let's see if I can find it in the actual letter. Um, the, the thing is, is that the warrant, uh, let's see, the warrant can only be picked up by a judge in the actual jurisdiction of the crime. I cannot find it in the letter. The, their letter is not as nicely highlighted as the congressional letter was. Uh... Okay, two narrow cases. There's, uh, in fact, the congressional letter here. I'll put all these in the comments if I can remember to. Um, the congress or the the Department of Justice letter back to the Congress and the Senator actually has a detailed explanation about the two types of crimes: the botnets and this uh, investigation uh, that the FBI did. Okay, the amendment rule limits. Okay, there it is. The amended rule limits forum shopping by restricting the venue in which a magistrate judge may issue 
issue a warrant for a remote search to, quote, any district where activities related to a crime may have occurred. Often this language will leave only a single district in which investigators can seek a warrant. For example, where a victim has received death threats, extortion demands, or ransomware demands from criminal hiding behind internet anonymizing technology, the victim's district would likely be the only district in which the warrant could be informed for a remote search to identify the perpetrator. Okay, I like their answer. Now, the Department of Justice was criticized for having not real good answers. Uh, frankly, I, I read through this whole letter and I thought it was, I thought it was very well reasoned. Um, and that is a very well reasoned thing. You know, I, I can't go to, I can't go to the judge in Texas um, because the actual server is located in Virginia, but the but the idiot that's breaking the law on it's up in I don't know Massachusetts or whatever. You know the warrant has to be issued where the server is found in Virginia. That's exactly what it says. So they prevent forum shopping in that manner. Now the problem is, of course, is how broad this term means because what they actually say. Um, what they actually say is a magistrate judge with authority in any district where activity related to a crime may have occurred. That's the problem. The Department of Justice letter back is very clear and very wonderful. And if that were what the wording was in Rule 41, I'd calm down a little about it. But they literally say any activity related to the crime may have occurred. That means that some guy in this city, some wherever you can find the, the judge, Mm, I can see the point. <laughs> I really can see the point. All right. So number two, though, the Congress comes back and asks, we are concerned that the deployment of software to search for and possibly disable the botnet may have unintended consequences. So this is kind of neat because they're all the, the Department of Justice and Congress is going all back and forth about the botnets and shutting these down remotely and we don't even need to know who the users are and, and all this back and forth. The problem is the rule has nothing to do with that type of language. There's nothing in the rule that says we as the federal government can go on to Joe Blow's computer in Massachusetts and disable the botnet's virus on his computer and then let him know about it. The ruling simply says that we may have access coming back up here to search and seize or copy electronically stored information. That's the problem. There's nothing on here about taking out botnets. All of the language in here simply says, if there is any connection to this botnet, we may search, seize, or copy. Now, the Department of Justice letter, if you read that, goes on to say, we're just going to be looking at the information related to the botnet. We're not going to be looking at personal files. This is where it gets turry. This is really where it gets turry. Okay, because it's not a matter of what does the letter the Department of Justice says. And it's not a matter of what is Congress's concern. What matters is what the actual rule in the handbook says. That's the problem. So as we look at this, it's a noble thing to want to take out the predators. It's a noble thing to want to take out the botnets. But the language in Rule 41 seems to offer a blanket search seizure, and copy for any crime anywhere it's committed across any device, whether the user is aware of it or not. And that opens up the big backdoor questions to Rule 41 and why it's so controversial. So why is this so controversial? Well, let's take... We've already talked about the issue of patent patent trolls and, and forum shopping. The language in the Department of Justice says, oh yeah, that's no problem. Sounds kind of like one president saying, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. <laughs> till it happens, until the thing passes, and then all hell breaks loose in the entire healthcare system. 
The great news is my insurance, you know, my insurance now covers mammogram insurance. Bad news is it cost me 37% more the day ACA passed it. You know, I'm a guy, I don't really need mammogram insurance. And, and yeah, I've heard the argument, well, man, you get breast cancer too. Yeah, I have a much greater chance of getting a lot of other cancers than breast cancer. I really don't think I need mammogram insurance. And a decent insurance plan is probably going to cover a little of that here and there. But I don't need to go up for, for monthly inspections. They should at least make the plan you know, relevant to your gender. One size fits all is all size fits none. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's talk about botnets. So if I happen to get an infection on a computer or an IoT device, that now gives them, according to the rules, not according to the letter, I get the letter. The letter is very clear. The letter sound, makes it sound like, wow, the government's looking out for me. It's kind of like reading 1984, you know? The government's looking out for me. Yeah, I feel great. The problem is the letter is not the law. The law, again, I will read it again verbatim. It says, a magistrate judge with authority in any district where activities related to a crime may have occurred has authority. Uh, how about may have occurred? May have occurred has authority to issue a warrant to use remote access to search electronic storage media and to seize or copy electronically stored information located within or outside that district. Translation, blanket statement. We think a law has possibly been broken. We can hack all your devices. I don't care what the letter said. What, what their letter, their response back was a wonderful response and I agreed completely with their response. But the letter of the law specifically grants them that access and that's what I have a problem with. Which means, uh, I, I think I deleted 15 or 20 of them today. I know every time I get on the email I say 15 or 20. I should have gone through there and, and looked up the exact number. Because if I go into my inbox, actually my deleted box, and I look for everything that has an attachment to it, because I haven't deleted any of my you know, real emails with attachments. If I look at everything in the attachments, there's probably several hundred in there. And if the, some random guy is sending me, hey, here's the attached invoice from some guy I have no idea. It's a .zip file. Yeah, let's open that bad boy right up. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's either an encrypto virus or it's a botnet backdoor or it's a key logger. It's, it's not an invoice, okay? It's not an invoice. I know that, got that figured. And I still would love to tear the hard drive out of a computer, boot it up on some live key distribution just to see what these emails are. I'm just, inquiry minds wanna know. <laughs> Thumbs up if you want me to do a video of it. I'll actually do it if you want, you know? I'll go on, download them, not like there's anything real on that email address anyway. I'll go ahead and throw, I don't know, a simple screen recorder on Tails or something and show you what it is. And <laughs> that'd be fun. Wow. <laughs> but anyway. So suppose I'm over here working on my Mac and my Mac is kind of at a different angle than my Windows. So I'm over here working, typing on my Mac computer. Go to the Linux guy. And, and my back's kind of turned my Windows computer and my keyboard's on and, and, and my nefarious virus spewing cat jumps up on the desk and walks across the keyboard, name it a volcano, and he hits hit, open, enter, and now you now have a virus on my computer. Now the FBI has the authorization to take a copy of my computer by the letter of the law. <laughs> that's a problem that's a problem that raises some serious concerns because I have not done anything nefarious my cat is just dumb eh, maybe not Katie are you dumb well I think one of them is but I'm not sure <sighs> I didn't violate any crime. I had some idiot, uh, some idiot that's trying to infect my computer with some virus sends me a message every single day. I, after I said come, 
Haha, -ha, thumbs up for the kitty. Say hi, kitty. Say hi to the YouTube world. Yeah. This guy here is known as the epitome of cuteness. All right, epitome. Let's see if the other one wants to come over. And, oh, no, she's kind of the scaredy cat. She's running away. Okay. So anyway, all I'm doing is just going about my day. Some guy that I have no connection to who's harvested my email, sends me something, potentially infects the computer, and that gives the government the right to look over my computer. That's the problem with Rule 41. But there's more. But wait, there's more. Let's address the issue of rogue agents. Hmm. This can break into a few factors. So one of the factors to look at is one of them is nefariously acting rogue agents and the other is um, not nefariously, but, but um, rogue agents that are out for a conviction. So suppose, suppose that, that uh, you know, you're just online, you're just whatever, you have a botnet. Um, maybe in, in, a, in a case I had recently, in fact, just, just today I received a, uh, another email from my security team on my hosting system that, that one of my accounts in Australia, a WordPress site in Australia that I don't personally manage, but it's hosted on my servers, got hacked. Again, and I've tried to tell them you need to secure your WordPress better, so I shut the server down. Um, until such time that it's fixed, either they hire me to fix it or they hire someone else to fix it. But I'm told your server's shut down until such time that we're going to get it, you know, that somebody gets it fixed. And so if that server, now the last time I had had that happen with my servers, because, you know, I, one of my sites, I'm a little foolish and I'm running a Envato theme on and they're just major hack targets. Well, I'm on there one day, I get a text and a security alert from my security system on the back end. Someone's trying to hack my site. They're getting in, they're attempting to install a porn site, a porn distribution site on my server. Well, I'm over there deleting the files as they're adding them, locking them out, blocking them out, doing whatever I can. <sighs> Fighting with them for a good couple hours. I finally won, beat the guys out, hacked them out, lo or locked the hackers out, re-accessed my site, got all my stuff back online, cleaned everything up, did all of that. Now, uh, and, and I'm not, I don't know if it was a, a legal porn site, an illegal porn site, I don't know, but it was my server, not their server, therefore now it's an illegal porn site. Okay, so they're over there trying to do this on mine, trying to turn my, my site into some porn server. So suppose that the agent thinks that I'm just this nefarious evil hacker and he's identified my server as part of that and my name's attached to the server. Now he looks all the data and he's kind of on the fence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but he's up for promotion. He needs to get one more guy convicted. Well, we got that porn for the other stuff. And then he takes a, he hacks my stuff, throws bad stuff on my servers, takes a copy of my servers, says, and arrests me and says, hey, how's this guy? He's distributing porn, illegal stuff. That would be an example of a rogue agent out for a conviction. And that's why I do not like rule 41 because we cannot control these human people that operate all this kind of stuff. I want to have a better paper trail. I want to be able to see more information. And there is a second type of rogue agent though. Um, if you are familiar with the Silk Road takedown, if not, uh, actually the best thing I've seen on that is the, there is actually the, the last episode season 10 on American greed is actually on the, um, uh, the Silk Road takedown and actually you can access it currently uh, you can access it on uh, view.yahoo.com which uh, gives you some of the free uh, Hulu access stuff so you can watch it on there for free and uh, at least at the time of this video it, that site changes a lot so it may go away sometime soon uh, but uh, they actually detailed the whole investigation into Silk Road, which was traditional police work without having to do all these crazy, weird Rule 41 stuff to find anybody. Traditional police work got site administrators and finally the site owner got the site taken down. Everything would have been a happy story, 
except there was not one, but two rogue agents involved in it that were not related. It wasn't like two guys working together. It was two guys that were extorting the site. They were tasked to take down. They were extorting the site for their own personal financial gain. And that's another case of a rogue agent. I do not trust that a rogue agent's not gonna get in there if we're left to allow them to hack all of our systems. It's one thing if five guys come in with an actual search warrant. That's one thing. Five guys with a search warrant, there's a lot more accountability there. But to come back and say one guy or just a couple guys in a room, it's just too easy to, you know, is if you're doing it all remotely, rogue agents can cause a lot of problems. And that's what ended up happening is you had a rogue hacker agent in two different instances on that one case involved. And so I may trust the government, but I may not trust the individuals acting in that government. And while most of them are likely doing it for wonderful reasons and are fabulous people and are truly following the law and truly saying, this guy's innocent, this guy's guilty, we have solid evidence of each. There are going to be the outliers that are either A, seriously out for a conviction and may plant evidence, or B, out to just extort people who they know are, are doing wrong but making money doing it. Because, heck, why not? And that's the problem with Rule 41. It gives way too much power to people to do that kind of stuff. Um, another argument, uh, what's the name? Um, Edward Snowden uses this argument a few different places, uh, and I forget the exact name. I think it's turnkey government, I think is what he says. Uh, I can't remember exactly. But, but this is a legitimate problem with Rule 41 and, and how our government, even if we trust the government today, as the argument goes, can we trust the government tomorrow? That's the, that's the question. So, and that goes back to all of the data collection and all of the privacy and all this stuff. Can we trust forever going forward. We may trust now, but can we trust tomorrow? And this, this kind of rang through in Nazi Germany. I, was it Slavia or Poland? I forget which, which country it was now. Um, but they cataloged everybody's religion. They cataloged everybody's everything, really. And the government wasn't nefarious at all. There wasn't a problem. But Hitler came in and took over all those records and now he was the established government and he had a giant wealth of all of the information of all of the people. And the people were exploited based upon the information that the government knew about them. And that's the problem with that turnkey democracy situation is with Rule 41 and how it's written in the law, I understand the letter that was written to the Department of Justice. And I thought it did a decent job. In fact, I thought it did a much better job of clarifying Congress's questions than people gave it credit for. Because a lot of the articles are like, they sort of gave a response. No, actually I was, I was, uh, you know, like, like Agrippa before Paul, almost thou hast convinced of me. <laughs> but I had to come back to this, realizing that that letter is not the framework of the law. The law is this little thing that says if A, you are behind an anonymizing service, or B, your computer is part of a botnet, we have the right to have any judge anywhere there's any part of this issue to search, seize, or copy your data. That is the problem with Rule 41. There's a lot of problems with it. I get the purpose. This is, this is a classic example of doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. We need to track down a way. But using current legal means, we have to track down a way to stop pedophilia rings. We have to come up with a way to stop fraudulent internet crime. We have to come up with a way to stop the botnets. Mass surveillance of people is not the answer and mass search and seizure of people is not the answer. So what are some of the solutions? I did not write these down. I'm gonna go off the head on this. Well, regarding the, uh, regarding um, specifically, the, because the, the 
a playpen issue is specifically addressed in the Department of Justice letter. Um, I want to address that first. Well, there is actually an app where you can take photographs and snap photographs of hotel rooms you stay at, other things, other places, and stuff like this. It's kind of part of Google's doing this entire thing where, where they're working on technology that can pinpoint a location not based on a GPS tracking location, but by examining all the background around you. Well, the same technology is actually being implied to track down where these crimes against children are occurring. And it's a fabulous thing because a guy, if a guy wants to explore a child and he goes to a hotel room and they do whatever because it's like, well, it's not my house and all the background stuff, whatever, you know, the problem he's got <laughs> is that if some guy comes in and just snaps photos of all these hotel rooms and uploads them to the site, this becomes an awesome database where... The FBI, if they track down these photos and they grab these photos, they can cross-reference the photos that are illegal with the photos that other guests at the hotels or whatever have uploaded and actual cases have been solved like that because they go back and they say, ah, here's a case right here. This is where this happened. Now let's see if we can track down some time periods. And they can kind of come down some time periods. And now they have a legitimate thing to go to the hotel and say, we know that this happened in this exact hotel room sometime between this date and this date. Can you check your records and see who might fit these criteria? And that is a very, very, very good, legitimate, excellent search warrant. And that type of approach has led to several of these takedowns. And that's a great thing. That's one of the things that we can do in that respect. Regarding some of the, um, like, uh, moving off of that particular issue, how about some of the, the fraud things, like the encryptoviruses? Um, I get that, that, that we need to come up with a means to take down botnets and to track down where these encryptovirus people are coming from. But I think that there's better ways to doing that. For example, one of the things in the, in the Silk Road takedown is that the Bitcoin trans, uh, transactions, although they're not tied to any specific people, you can actually watch them if you can watch. It's kind of like you, you can, in theory, break the Tor encryption if you can control enough nodes to have the entry node and the exit node simultaneously. The problem is the nodes will change from time to time. And so getting the, you know, getting the information, well, if you have access to the beginning and the end point of a Bitcoin transaction by knowing what's in some of the Bitcoin wallets, you can actually trace some of the money that way. So that's a good legitimate way. Uh, another means is better participation with law enforcement between, between different governments, which is not always easy. But, you know, I ran into a, an issue with, and I talked about this in my video, Scamming the Scammers. Uh, and on Scamming the Scammers, what I ended up doing was, um, you know, I, I got a lot of information and I sent all that information to the FTC, to the Attorney General and to the Attorney General in my state and the state complaint lines, whatever else. They just sent back stupid form letters like, doo, 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 we can't do anything, whatever. And it's like, you know, I gave you legitimate information that's not the fake number they called me from. Why don't you guys start there? Why don't you start by calling the 877 number that they gave me that I have to call them for a booking? Because that is a company that's got some ties in this country. You guys go figure out what the ties are. I gave you the information. I did a little bit of the legwork for you. you want more help? I'll help you more. Go for it. Okay. But we need to have some of these better, uh, better means uh, of communicating back and forth. Uh, we also need a whole lot better internet security um, is on multiple levels. First and first and absolute foremost is with us as people. Um, I am appalled that the school districts here in very educated state college area, um, they give email addresses in first grade to their kids, but they never talk about internet security, internet privacy, or anything else. They don't talk about using strong passwords. They don't talk about what to open, what not to open. They don't talk about scams, shams, none of that. It's like, here, kid, have an email address. And there's no privacy training. 
and I was at a uh, seminar that, that actually um, is an extension arm of the Penn State main campus that works with small businesses in the community to secure them with, you know, help them out with some of this internet security training. And I asked the present, the presenter, I said, you know, is there any, uh, do you have any connections or any work or is anybody doing any connections in the work with the high schools and the middle schools to teach kids this stuff? And sadly, they're like, no, there's n nobody's talking about this stuff. So that's the first problem is we have this extreme amount of naivety about internet security in general. Um, we also, I, as I argued in my uh, Linux antivirus thing, we need to, in the Linux community, start running antivirus, particularly on our web servers. Because if our web servers were emails and other files are going back and forth, while the Linux systems will not get infected with most of those viruses because they're Windows-based viruses, a antivirus program can stop and delete the Windows virus and so basically Linux computers, Linux servers, if you think of it, I think Apache servers, Linux servers run like 70% of all websites, I think. Well, you know, all this malicious code is being hosted somewhere. And if those servers were running antivirus, it might actually help the problem. So the Linux servers, unfortunately, because they're not connected, there's so many of them, they're all actually breeding grounds for the viruses. So taking that down could actually significantly prevent the botnets. Um, the other thing is to teach people that as far as IoT devices go, simply rebooting the device clears the botnet. And so we should, we should get people on a regular cycle training to stop and reboot this, the device at least once a day, maybe twice a day. I mean, does it have to be on 24-7, 365 period? No. Boot that thing on and off. A couple times a day. And if you're in a like in a script, like a, in an office here where I have a lot of Linux computers that are on, I could actually write some cron jobs that do that. Just go to each of the cameras and you know boot cycle them. Now in my case, the best security is to not keep stuff on. If I'm around the house, my IP cameras are not turned on. You know, I, I don't want them turned on if I'm here. But if I leave, I leave the house, flip the switch, they're on. Um, but they're off otherwise because I do not need the open-ended hacking target towards me. And, and the next thing is in the consumer world, we need to stop focusing so much on the latest and greatest internet technology stuff. We need to get to the point where we're like, okay, this piece of technology, really cool, awesome, helpful, useful, but sorry, refrigerator, I will make my own shopping list. And... Thank you for informing me you're on stove, but the little red light does that. And coffee pot, I don't care if you're running low on coffee, um, get off my network. Okay, that's the type of stuff we need to do. We need to be a little bit more conscious about what we have, which is actually better for our lives as well. <laughs> so this has been a long video. This is possibly the longest video I've done, uh, but rule 41's out today. And I gotta say, it's a scary thing very scary thing um, all that being said another mo <laughs> this way <laughs> right there another thing we can do it's way too early in the morning <laughs> I gotta get up early too so I gotta wrap this up switching over to Linux uh, could potentially help as well definitely minimize the amount of viruses uh, that we have especially for keeping updated systems um, but overall, you know, we're in a we're in a crazy world. I agree that there's problems. I think that the problems Rule 41 is trying to solve are good and legitimate problems and we need to dialogue and have some solution for these. But opening up potential mass search and seizure of computer data is not the answer. So and sadly, uh, it's hard to see what's gonna happen of this because it went into effect. It's a lot easier to stop it, but Congress and Senate decided not to act. They had until Wednesday to act. They decided not to act. So whatever happens to it, that's the deal. This has been Tom with a academic discussion on Switched to Linux.